So as most uh, in this room probably know, it's been a little over a month since Spotify announced it was buying Gimlet and Anchor, a move that sent shockwaves through the podcasting industry. And now uh, it's super exciting for us to have uh, representatives of all three companies on a stage together for the first time here at South by Southwest. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, including the overall state of the podcasting industry, um, how your three companies plan to work together now as one company, uh, big questions around exclusivity versus openness in distribution, and where the future growth potential lies for podcasting. Uh, we may also have a little news to announce, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but first, I, I want to see in the audience, um, raise your hand if you regularly listen to more than one podcast per week. Yeah. Okay, now I know there's some markers in the room, but uh, keep your hands raised if you skip the ads. Yeah, all right. We'll get to that later. Um, so I want to start with Don. Uh, Don, can you kind of set the stage for us and tell us what the overall promise of podcasts for Spotify uh, are, and, and why did you do these two acquisitions? Well, first and foremost, you know, Daniel Eck, who has been um, really the most innovative, I think, um, person in the music industry, has noticed that there's been a huge shift. And um, right now, we know that becoming the world's number one audio platform is a, a big mandate for us. And podcasting, obviously, plays a big role in that. We're seeing podcasts um, increase in the US alone uh, beyond anything I, I think any of us could have imagined. Uh, the latest statistics from Edison was that last year, Half of the people in the U.S. listened to a podcast last year, and now it's one uh, in every three Americans listen to a podcast once a month. And those numbers have grown um, over the past year. I think it's at 90 million people listened, uh, are expected to listen this year, and that's an increase of 20 million uh, over year over year. So when you hear those statistics, you realize that this is a medium that is really on the verge or has already started to really explode. And if we want to be the world's largest audio platform, podcasting has to play a part in that. So uh, about 18 months ago, we started to get into the podcast business by having um, a large offering. We started to have catalog content on our platform. Towards the end of last year, we started to make some original content. And in looking at how we can really support in terms of investment and resources the industry at large because we really believe that it will have a huge future we started to look at companies and Gimlet and Anchor were two of the leaders in the industry for different reasons um, Gimlet because obviously the content that they make is considered to be the best in the industry both in terms of quality and success and Anchor because they afford creators the opportunity to not only create podcasts with incredible products and tools, but also distribute them and then ultimately monetize the podcast. So for different reasons, we looked at both of these companies and feel that they're uh, great assets for us to have as part of our offering and part of our family. And Matt, Gimlet, you know, most people in this room probably know you all for the hit shows you've made from Reply All to Homecoming. You were actually a partner of Spotify's before you were bought by Spotify. Can you give us a sense of, you know, why it was the right time to sell the company? Yeah, we, um, so Gimlet is a media company that's focused on telling stories through audio and mostly, most of what we make is podcasts. And if you come into our offices, what you'll be walking into is a building full of storytellers and people who want to have, who want to create worlds in audio that feel elevated and that deliver new experiences in audio for, for listeners who crave more. And part of that is reaching more people. So we're very driven by impact. And what we noticed over the last few years was um, our fastest growing distribution partner with Spotify. So two, two years ago, two and a half years ago, approximately 0% of our audience was coming from Spotify. At that point, Spotify wasn't really seriously in podcasts. And that's now grown to 15, approaching 20%. And so we looked at Spotify as sort of the next wave of growth in the industry. And we thought that we could have, we could, we could reach a global audience. You know, Spotify now has over 200 million people listening to audio 
on the platform. Most of what they're listening to is music, but we think they ought to be listening to a lot of podcasts too. And so it was, you know, reach, reach new audiences at global scale, finally get data that we could feed back to our creators um, to inform what kinds of choices we make about programming we, we do, as well as data back to advertisers to show them the effectiveness of the advertising dollars they're spent they're spending, and it felt like the right inflection point um, in the industry. And I think if you look at the Edison numbers, it tells you that. Like this, we are now at a tipping point. And this was this past year was the fastest growing year for for new audiences in in in, in podcasting, right? So it grew by 25% in the U.S. market, like Don Don said. And then if you zoom into where the growth is coming from, it's younger audiences. So fastest growing segment is 12 to 24s. They grew 30%. Uh, 33% last year, and where are they listening? They're listening on Spotify. Spotify is the number one platform for podcast listening amongst 12 to 24s, and that's the fastest growing segment. So we think it's the future, and we wanted to be part of the effort to make, uh, to, to get Gimlet, Gimlet um, shows and Gimlet programming in front of lots more people. And Michael, what about you and Anchor? It seems like you guys have a very different mission and value proposition, obviously, um, from Gimlet, complementary but, but different. Why was it the right time for you guys to sell? So I think if you look at podcasting and you think about um, where it's been and where it's going, um, it's, it's always been very difficult to make a podcast. Um, my co-founder and I actually tried to start our own podcast before uh, we launched Anchor, and we went to Google and we typed how to start a podcast and saw all of these tutorials on expensive microphones and hosting platforms, and it just seemed really, really complicated. So. We decided we wanted to build an easier way and uh, bake everything that you need to start a podcast all into, in, into one place, give it away for free. And I think that's really started to resonate with people. Um, you know, to Matt's point about uh, podcast consumption growing at a rate like we've never seen before, we're seeing the same thing on the creator side. More podcasts were created in 2018 uh, than in any other year before. And we're seeing over the past couple of years uh, the rate of podcasts, new podcasts, double each year, year over year. And uh, last year in particular, 40% of all new were powered by Anchor. And I think it really has to do with uh, just ease of use and how easy we're making it. And so if you think about um, you know, Spotify becoming the leading audio platform and exposing so many new listeners to the consumption of podcasts, we have to do the same thing on the creation side as well. So uh, we, were, we were thrilled to, uh, to join Spotify in that mission. Don, your boss, Daniel Eck, uh, when he announced these two acquisitions, he said in the blog post, quote, over time, more than 20% of all listening on Spotify will be non-music content. So what does podcasting as a business mean for Spotify? Is it an ancillary thing like video is to Amazon? It's a halo effect that gets subscribers to where you guys actually make money? Or is it a place where it could potentially be just as of much of a business as music because your margins are better. Can you give us a sense? Yeah, I think that's sort of there are two answers to that question. On the consumption side, I think it's going to play a huge part in Spotify because we're already seeing incredible numbers. People who come in and listen to podcasts spend twice as much time on the platform and they listen to more music, which is, you know, a surprise and um, we'll take that any day. But on the business side, I think the entire industry is going to go through growing pains and go through changes as the business matures and as it evolves. And part of what we hope to do is help lead and drive some of those changes in the industry um, so that the advertisers are really able to reach the consumers in a more effective way. And I think products and, uh, and, and different types of content will really afford that opportunity. What's great about um, the, the podcast business is, especially for a platform like Spotify, we can go very broad and very deep. And that's very similar to music. So there are so many similarities between what we're able to do in music and what we're able to do um, for podcasts, not only in terms of being able to connect creators to the users and transform their experience through curation and discovery, but also being able to really um, move the industry forward the way Daniel did in the music industry from a, from a revenue and profitability standpoint. 
Uh, Matt Gimlet, you guys have produced over two dozen shows to date. You currently have under a dozen or so under development. And as a company, you've won these prestigious awards like the Peabody. Um, it seems like what you've done is definitely more of an art, not a science. Um, what are you seeing that works from a content perspective for you guys? Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, like we're, we are really, we're really a shop that's driven by craft. And um, what we find is that when you look at what people, like why people listen to podcasts, like they're, for me, I view it through my own experience in audio. Like I, I, grew, the, I come to Gimlet and come to Spotify as a person who grew up obsessed with audio in the form of radio. So I, I grew up listening to um, like radio in the backseat of my parents' car on the way to school every day. We listened to NPR, and then I would listen to sports talk in the afternoon. And I, had a, I would do a, a jazz DJ that I would fall asleep to because I wanted to hear someone talking to me. And the thing I always loved about the medium of audio is the, the way in which when you're... Um, it's very distinct from, from TV or video because you're, you're hearing a person's voice and you're imagining them in your head. You're kind of co-creating the experience. And I love the sense of emotional connection I had with the people I listened to. And that's really why we started Gimlet. Like my, my co-founder, Alex Bloomberg, was a, is an amazing storyteller. He's one of the best in the world at what he does. He had created Planet Money and This American Life. And we both love the medium of audio. And the thing that we find now that drives people to listen are basically when we make a show, it has to do three things for people. One reason people listen is they want to be told a story. So this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and this is how I felt, right? So if you look at, um, you know, we make a show called Homecoming, which is a thriller, and it is about a series of events that unfold through conversation, and it's just, it's pacey, and it's, you want to hear what happens next. It has suspense. So people listen for story. Two is they listen for, um, they want to learn something new. And that could mean educational. So it could mean like we're going to, um, we do a show called Science Versus, which is one of the top science shows. And you will learn the, f the facts and evidence underneath controversial subjects of the day. So, um, or fad. So if you want to know whether the seven minute workout actually works, you can listen to Science Versus and find out if it will actually help you get get fit. Um, so you can learn that. And then the third thing is, and I think this is actually the most powerful one, and it's the one I related to uh, or, or referred to when I was a kid, was it's companionship. It's like you, people listen because they want to have a friend to hang out with. So if you listen to Reply All, which is, we make a show called Reply All. It's a, a show about the internet. And it's basically following along these journeys that, that our two co-hosts, um, PJ Vogt and Alex Goldman, take. And they're friends. And when you listen to the show, you feel like you are friends with them. So when we're looking at developing new shows, it has to hit two or three of those buckets. It's got to tell you a story that has suspense and stakes. It's got to teach you something, and it's got to keep you company. And speaking of new shows, you guys have some news about an update on a current show. So we, we make a show called Mogul um, that's a hip-hop documentary. And the first season told the story of hip-hop through one man's life, Chris Lighty, who was a manager um, and sort of a, an impresario in the hip-hop world. And we, it was a show that we partnered with Spotify on in our first season. It's going to be coming back for a second season this year. Um, Reggie Osei, who created the show with us, Combat Jack, um, passed away after the first season. So first, we're going to be telling his story. He has an amazing story about how he came of age and his role as sort of, a, as sort of a, a, the Eminence Grease interviewer of, in, in hip hop. Um, we're going to tell his story. And then we're going to move on to other moguls in hip hop. And we're going to be doing that as a Gimlet Spotify uh, collaboration that will be coming later this spring. Very cool. Michael, um, shifting to Anchor, uh, you guys really exist, like you said, to help creators uh, get into the podcasting world. It seems like you very much democratize the process by lowering the barrier to entry. Um, and then, you know, distribution and hopefully monetization for those creators. Um, and you mentioned that stat that 40% of new podcasts are, are coming from the platform um, overall. How did the platform grow in, you know, what is a relatively short amount of time, a few years, to, to being that place where now almost half of the industry's podcasts are starting? Yeah, I think, I think it really comes back to uh, ease of use. Right? Um, if you think about all of the steps, if you have an idea in your head for a podcast you want to start, there are so many things you need to do to actually get that podcast off the ground. Aside from the content, which is the whole reason you're doing it in the first place, you know, you've typically, like I said, had to buy an expensive microphone. You've had to understand confusing editing software. You've had to decide where you want to host your podcast. 
Uh, not to mention, how do I get my podcast on Spotify? How do I get it on all these other platforms? Really, really difficult. Um, I think with the explosion of podcasting, as we're all talking about, uh, Anchor has become just a very, very clear and straightforward path to do it. So you'd either spend hours on Google trying to figure out how to actually make a podcast and all the logistics I mentioned, or you could just download an app to your phone and just start talking. Um, so I think that has worked really, really well for us um, as a lot of new and emerging creators want to come into the space. But I think we're also seeing a lot of growth from existing podcasters as well. Um, I think that the, the space in general has, has kind of, uh, on the technology side at least, on a, from a creation standpoint, it's definitely lacked some innovation over the years. So, you know, in addition to making it easy, we've been trying to introduce features that solve problems in new ways, like podcasters wanting to interact with their audience. We let their audience literally send them voice messages that the podcaster can incorporate into their show. Um, or sponsorships, so getting paid as a podcaster is a typically very difficult thing. Um, so we've been able to leverage that scale that you mentioned to basically create the first sort of host red ad marketplace for podcasters and brands that want to advertise in their shows. So I think it's about making it easier, and I think it's about making it better and more forward thinking. Um, and there's probably a little bit of timing in there as well, since podcasting is just exploding at the moment. Mm -hmm. Don, I know it's early, and these acquisitions, like I said, are just a little over a month old. But uh, I want to get talk about autonomy and how you guys are thinking about uh, these two companies now being part of the larger Spotify brand, because you also have Spotify Studios, uh, which already makes a little over a dozen podcasts. Um, I highly recommend Dissect if. Uh, dissect if anyone's listened to that. Um, you have job openings right now for leading sports, comedy, kids content for Spotify Studios. Um, how do you intend to run these two businesses, I guess, starting with Gimlet? Is Gimlet going to be like the Pixar to Spotify's Disney? Are you going to more closely integrate it with Spotify Studios? And then we'll go to Anchor. Yeah, I think we're really initially looking at it more like Disney buying Pixar and just letting everybody do what they're doing so well um, continue, because why rock the boat when Gimlet has been having incredible success? We already work together in many different ways, as Matt articulated, but I think we also know that there is so much opportunity in terms of types of content in this podcast space, um, and you know, I've spent most of my career in television and film, um, although I started in radio. And storytelling, as, as Matt had said, is really the core piece of, of podcasting that interests me and I think has more or less um, you know, taken the consumer by surprise because there's an intimacy in the storytelling that really lends itself to a lot of the genres that we've seen already, like crime and, as, as, as we were talking about, um, you know, interview or, or informational shows. But I think there's a lot of other genres that would work in podcasting that have not yet been explored. So we are planning on um, trying many different things. And of course, you know, when you look at what has already been successful in podcast, um, be it either sports has been very successful, comedy is very successful, um, crime and, and dramatic storytelling has been successful. But there, there are other things that we'll, um, we'll try. And so as a result, we're looking at Spotify Studios as being able to build out many different types of verticals and, again, go broad and then ultimately go deeper. So existing in parallel with Gimlet, at least for the time. Yes. OK. And what about the value chain you're trying to create also with the Anchor piece? Because to me, it seems like it makes perfect sense for Anchor is the early you know signs of what is bubbling what is percolating in the industry you know the, the this fresher podcast the perhaps someone who's never had a podcast before an individual creator do you foresee maybe taking seeing someone doing well on the anchor platform pairing them with the gimlet guys saying hey we can bring you amazing quality production to this and then we can host you and distribute you on spotify are you thinking that fully in the value chain or are you not there yet we're not we haven't really thought it through quite in that way although as you, you know as you can imagine there are there are going to be many many opportunities i think what's core for us though is spotify's mission is really to connect creators to users and be able to use a global platform in which to do that so when you think about what anchor represents and all of the different podcasters that can 
easily go on the platform and be able to create. And then being able to connect uh, all those podcasters to different listeners around the world, that really fits right in our sweet spot for what our mission is. So it was a, it was a very easy um, fit. And I think you can see from the outside how without even doing much, it already has the same mission statement as, as our company. All right, so turning to the business side of podcasting, IEB estimates that uh, the industry will bring in $659 million in ad sales in 2020, uh, $514 million this year. Uh, Matt, you guys at Gimlet, something like 75% of your, your revenue is from these big brand advertisers, correct? Um, yeah. And you've got about 120 employees producing your stuff and helping sell it. It's a very high touch, human intensive business yeah. doing this branded advertising. Where are you seeing the demand from advertisers? Is it, is it the more traditional brought to you by reads? Is it um, their own shows? I think Twitter just announced it has its own podcast this morning. Facebook has What's one, Netflix has one. It's <laughs> something for advertisers, I think. Oh. Um, Netflix has its podcast. You know, are they gonna start just doing their own shows? Or is it, what are you, what are you seeing? Yeah, so when, when we started Gimlet, like one of the idea one of the ideas was this is a new on demand audio is a new medium and so it requires a new kind of storytelling. And you can do things in on demand that didn't quite make as much sense in linear radio. But we also thought we should create a new ad product. And so we always like the principles we always had was the ads should be should feel like they are um, incremental to the listening experience. So in the same way that when you, you know, when you open Vogue magazine, the ads feel like they add to the experience. If you took out the ads, it would be a lesser experience. And so um, all the, just about all the ads that you hear on Gimlet are made by Gimlet Creative, which is our in-house um, audio agency. And often they're read by the hosts of the show. We, we dynamically insert all the ads. So once we've fulfilled on an order from an advertiser, we can swap them out with, with new ads. And a lot of our content is evergreen. So um, our, our catalog generates quite a lot of listening from old episodes. Um, but the thing that, we, the demand we're seeing from brands is all the growth that we talked about make audio a more relevant medium for, for consumers, for audiences, and so it makes it a more relevant medium for brands too. So if you're trying to reach younger audiences, you know, our, our audience is median age of 30 years old. They're more affluent, they're more educated than the general population. They're very hard to reach um, because they don't see ads elsewhere. So they, they watch a ton of television, but they're watching on Netflix and Amazon where they don't see ads. Um, more than half of them use ad blockers. So they're on the internet all that day, but they've got their ads blocked. And then we've, in, in podcasting, which sort of as, as a community, we've created this advertising experience that feels native. It doesn't feel annoying. Some people skip the ads, I get it. Um, but uh, brands are, want access to these audiences and want to do it in a way that feels like it builds emotional affinity and that their brands are speaking in a voice that you know, relates to, to these audiences. I would say if you look at, so what we're seeing from brands a lot is like, oh yeah, we really want to be in audio, we want to be in podcasting, but we don't exactly know how to do it. Um, and it could be we don't, uh, we don't know how to access the scale or we don't know how to act, get um, the data that we need um, to feel comfortable like making repeat large buys. Now with Spotify, we have the scale and we have the data. But I would say the third thing is um, brands have to find their voice now. So if you looked at the, um, if you looked at like the Fortune 50 brands, um, I would bet that all of them have a style guide for what their logo is, what colors are in the logo, what the typeface is, and how it should be represented in all kinds of different spaces, whether it's a billboard or a, a magazine um, or anywhere else. And very few of them have audio style guides, which say, here's what we sound like, here's our tone of voice, here are the kinds of stories we tell. And in order to fully realize the opportunity in, in audio, brands need that. They need an audio strategy, and then they need help in executing it. And that's what Gimlet Creative does. Um, our, our, our agency has helped brands de develop that. So for instance, right now, we're, so they make all the ads on Gimlet. We'll probably start to make ads that are running across all, all of Spotify as well. But we also do deeper integration. So, um, we're making a show, uh, we, we make whole podcasts in, in partnership with brands. So we're doing a project with Ancestry.com right now, um, which is called The Unclaimed, 
Uh, it's coming out later this spring, and, it te- and it's really story-driven, so it's not an advertisement. Um, but it tells the story of an old psychiatric hospital in Oregon where um, thousands of people over, over the last century have died and been unclaimed by their families. So it's called The Unclaimed. And so these are stories and voices that have been sort of lost to time. Actually, they were set in little, the, the, these, these, these people were, were cremated and put in little copper canisters that were locked away in the psychiatric hospital. And so we've gone in and begun to research and explore their stories in partnership with, with Ancestry. Um, and under the belief that every story deserves to be told. And that aligns with Ancestry's sort of um, values, their brand values, and the kinds of um, the kinds of stories they want to tell, and so that that'll be coming later this spring. And that's an intensive, you know, narrative nonfiction, almost journalistic approach to the work. So it's it's it is um, ultimately it's brand building. It's not you know independent journalism, but it. Um, but it takes that kind of approach, and we have teams of people who will do that kind of thing. And I want to get to the difference between what you guys do in, and what Anchor does in the ad space, but I also want you to talk about what you guys are doing in voice Alexa stuff, because you, you had one skill for kids, toothbrushing, yes. that yes. did very well, um, yeah. and you've got something else coming, right? Yes, we, we make a toothbrushing skill, so, which really grew out of you're trying to solve a problem for, for parents. So I have two kids, and they hate brushing their teeth. They just hate it, but you have to brush your teeth unless you want to have like really bad breath and rotting teeth. So we, 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 we thought, could we take the toothbrushing experience, which is difficult and, and kids don't want to do it, and make it fun? And so we created a audio experience called Chompers, which is a two-minute toothbrushing experience that has entertainment, games, quizzes, new content every morning and every evening. So now my kids come into the bathroom and they say, Alexa, start Chompers. And they get this two-minute experience, at the end of which, Alexa says, three, two, one, spit, and they spit. And now they're done brushing their teeth. Can I, can I use, use that, that with my teenagers? I'd like to know. We need it. Because yeah. I, I, I think I need that for, yes. for my I could have used that growing kids. up. And so, yeah. so we think, you know, so we're doing more. Uh, part of an audio strategy for brands is, yes, what, um, what your voice is, what you sound like, what your 15s and 30s that are going to run on Spotify is, what your podcast is, but also what, how you surface on Alexa. And so we're, we're working on a project right now with McDonald's, actually, um, called the Happy Meal Time Travel Challenge, which is uh, it's, it's, it's a trivia-based game for kids to listen to with their parents. Uh, free of screens, so it's 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 there's no screen time involved. It's all through Alexa, and it's um, trivia about history and stories and 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 games that we're doing in partnership with McDonald's around the same idea. And it's 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 natively interactive. And you know, cool. I think what's so interesting about what Matt is is saying is that there's a different type of connection with the consumer for the advertisers. And when you look at the uh, amount of money that's being spent in media, at least in the US, right? You've got a a $200 billion business. And if you think about 63 to 70 billion of that is spent on traditional media platforms. But as more young people are are, are, are migrating away and starting to go to new forms of mediums, including podcasting, you can see how a lot of that connection and money is going to shift over. And so I think, you know, the the way in which Gimlet has been reaching the audience is indicative of the, the future and where the ad market is going to go. And on the other side, Michael, what you guys do with Anchor, you're very different. You're more of a tech company. You're about a fourth of the size and headcount of Gimlet. What you do is more akin to the traditional programmatic um, ad delivery system where you're pairing creators with advertisers, scripts. Um, can you walk us through how that works and sure. how that is, is how that works for advertisers? Are they seeing ROI with these kind of niche audiences? Yeah, so we saw the same we, we saw the same things happening with podcast advertising as Matt just talked about. Super authentic format, really resonates with its with its listeners, performs really well, so brands uh, want access to it. Um, but it's typically been a pretty manual process. I'm sure you can attest to that. Um, most podcasters typically can't access advertising revenue unless they're one of the top podcasts, say 50,000 downloads per episode and above. 
Uh, Anchor being the platform that um, is sort of the starting point for many, many new podcasters, typically might take a lot of them a while to get to that point. But in aggregate, there's tremendous scale. And so what we realized was through that scale and through our tools, our creation tools and our distribution tools, we could actually take what was working really, really well about podcast advertising, which is the host read ads, um, the really authentic reads that are coming from the hosts inside of the, the podcast. And we could basically create a marketplace where brands could come to Anchor, tell us the types of shows that they want to be on, and we can deliver a script, we can deliver information uh, about the brand, uh, we can give you know, an, uh, basically an unlimited number of creators on our platform access uh, to the opportunity to read for these brands um, and basically spread the spend out across the entire network. So we are inserting them dynamically, uh, much in the same way uh, Gimlet is, and they are host read. It's just happening more at scale and basically diversifying the brand spend. And I think what's interesting, which what, what we've found is a lot of the smaller shows actually perform better than the larger shows. Like, so we'll see these, in fact, just the other day, uh, we wrapped up a campaign with a, a big podcast advertiser, um, one that you know, you've, many of you probably hear in a lot of the podcasts you listen to, and they reported back to us that the, uh, in the campaign that they ran with us, it was the smallest shows out of the bunch with the smallest audiences that had the highest rate of return uh, on that specific investment. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it, right? If you're a listener um, that's gonna find a podcast that is not getting a ton of promotion, it's not getting a ton of attention in the top of the charts and things like that, and you're gonna have really high intent to listen to it, you're probably paying a lot of attention to what the host has to say, and therefore the ad will probably resonate a lot better with you. So um, we think there's a lot of room to grow this market, and a lot of that room exists in the ocean of creators that haven't typically been able to access the ad dollars. And how many creators on the platform are, are making money through the sponsorship program? So what's really interesting is when we launched um, anchor sponsorships, we, we did some research and we found that um, about 1% of the podcasts in the U.S. were monetizing via ads. Uh, this was right at the end of 2018. In the time since, we've, we've literally, through sponsorships, tripled uh, the number of podcasters in the U.S. who can make money, who are making money uh, via ads. So we feel like we're really growing the pie in terms of what's possible. How niche are we talking here with uh, making money? I mean, is this like an audience of 100 people? I mean, how niche can these shows actually be and make money? Yeah, so we have, so what's cool is we, we offer a couple of different opportunities. So you've got your sponsorship opportunity, which I think the revenue that you generate grows with the scale of listenership, right? So if you start at 100 and then go to 1,000 plays and maybe 10,000, you start to see the numbers flow in in terms of dollars. But if you're really focused on a very small niche audience, you can also take advantage of uh, like a listener support model, which is also a feature we offer. So you can basically accept uh, donations and recurring payments directly from your listeners through um, Apple Pay and Google Pay. So we're seeing, honestly, we're seeing niche podcasts with you know a couple hundred listeners make real money, put real money in their pockets through these through these donations. And as they scale up, they can start to make more meaningful revenue through sponsorships. All right, I want to turn to this big question of exclusivity versus openness, something that I'm sure a lot of people in the room or in the industry are probably worried about uh, right now, because podcasting has traditionally been this very open, RSS-based industry with very few silos. Um, Apple, the longest player, you know, the longest history in the industry has been pretty open with their approach um, and, and exclusivity and all that. And I don't think anyone wants to go to the phase we were in when Tidal and Apple Music were vying for exclusives and you had Kanye's album on one and Beyonce's album on the other. And uh, it, you know, it, it was a frustrating experience for consumers. It fragments the marketplace. Um, and there's already a lot of money being thrown around, right? Um, so I want to hear from each of you on this, I guess starting with, with you, Don, because it seems like the long-term value of these two acquisitions, which you spent about 340 million on for Spotify, is that it's exclusive. That Gimlet's content is exclusive to your platform. That Anchor's technology and its distribution is a funnel into Spotify and not your competitors. So, um, is that the plan? No, I think really, especially with these two acquisitions, that was not the plan. Um, and I think we were very clear and vocal about that, even uh, on our shareholders' call, because. Really, we do think that these two companies, you know, 
should be um, ubiquitous at this point and the distribution should, should not be the issue. I think ultimately as the business matures, Overall, I think there may be um, there may be some content that winds up being exclusive, and I think it's a case by case basis. And people will, I believe, experiment with windowing, um, much in the same way you know it's happened in television. So I don't know if I would compare it quite in the same way to music or to television. It may be some kind of a of a hybrid um, in some way. But the way we're approaching it now is. We just want the best experience for users. And so we really are about having content on multiple platforms. I think we are going to experiment with some windowing, some exclusivity for different time periods. Um, but it's really a case by case basis and we haven't really set any kind of specific parameters around how we're going to approach it. And, yeah, and I, yeah, go ahead. No, and I can just say, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And um, you know, like Don mentioned earlier, part of Spotify's mission is to enable a million creators to make a living off their work. And so if you're going to build a platform for creators, you have to really think about creators' needs and what the creator wants right now. And the bottom line is creators right now, especially as it relates to Anchor, they, they want to be everywhere because their listeners are everywhere. And so if we were building a creator tools platform um, that forced you to only distribute in one place and not to every place where your listeners are, you probably wouldn't want to use that platform right now. So. In, you know, in this pursuit of a mission where you want a million creators to make a living off their work, you have to, you have to give them what they want, and they want to be able to distribute everywhere. And Matt, I know you, you guys at Gimlet have already said that current Gimlet shows um, will stay wherever they are, but you may not be able to make the same promise for future shows. And it sounds like windowing is maybe the approach that, that you'll take. We'll experiment with the right ways to distribute the shows. I mean, I'm, you, you heard from the chief. I'm not going to contradict the chief. <laughs> there we go. Um, but I think we, we will experiment. We've actually already done windowing. So, you know, Mogul season one that I talked about was windowed on Spotify. And we have a show called Crime Town that's right now windowed on Spotify. Later this year, it will go wide. Um, both those shows were also available to all listeners for free. So Spotify has a free tier and a paid tier. And all of the content is available on both. All right. Um, so shifting to the consumer experience, um, I guess, again, starting with you, Don, where is the opportunity to improve uh, the discovery and the listening experience for consumers? Is Spotify working on like a Discover Weekly for podcasts? Well, I think, you know, when you look at what Spotify does in music, which is, you know, again, having just a transformational user experience, when you look at the curation and the discovery for the music um, part of our platform, I think we're hopefully going to get to that place on the podcast side as well. We are already working on different products and tools that are making discovery much easier. Um, and as the, as the library that we have on our platform and as the user uses the content more, we learn more about them every day. And so we're able to take that information and curate the experience for them, giving them the types of content that is of greatest, greatest interest to them. Um, and so that is front and center for us now. Um, we're also very much about being able to create differentiated experiences, like when you look at our playlists, which really takes the music that already exists in them. And as you said, everybody has music, but the way in which we create the playlist is what makes our user experience so unique. Um, and so that's another uh, plan for podcasting and, and then obviously being able to um, be able to grow the amount of podcasts that we have not only on our platform but really in the industry is, is front and center for us because we know that this is going to be a medium that's just going to continue. It has a lot of growth ahead of it and so making as much content as possible is really where, where our efforts are going. And I think, you know, a way in which Anchor can contribute to that and is contributing to that is kind of expanding the universe of the types of podcasts that can exist by lowering the barrier. Um, you know, if you think back to the way podcasts, uh, you know, were made in a studio and, and still are obviously made in a studio uh, with large investments of time and capital, um, if you're going to invest a lot of money in a podcast, you, you've got to invest it in something that is going to give you a return. And, there are obviously really proven formats out there that have worked very, very well. Um, you know, Gimlet makes some of the greatest podcasts in the world. Um, 
But what, what we're seeing on Anchor is when you reduce the barrier and you lower the friction to basically nothing, you sort of enable all of these new interesting topics and genres and formats to emerge um, from you know, new types of people that were never contributing to the medium before. So I think the way in which we contribute to the consumption experience is you know, showcasing people what else is out there. We've got, you know, we've, we've had people literally publish a podcast from the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, there was a what family. What is that podcast about getting <laughs> it was, there? It, it was about getting there, yeah. <laughs> um, we've had, there's a family that publishes a podcast um, from like their boat in the middle of the ocean. Um, somebody in my office was telling me recently that there's like this really strong community of woodworking podcasters, like all these woodworking podcasts. Um, and there are a couple of them that are making a lot of money through support and donations. Um, and so I think, you know, I think what Spotify can really do here is not only can they expose so many more listeners to podcasts, but they can bring them a new diverse set of content that didn't really exist before. Matt, you have any thoughts? Yeah, no, that's what I, that's what I love about the medium is that like it, podcasting is not one thing. Right. Right. In the same way that you know, when when like in the same way that video and television is one, not one thing, huge difference between watching Game of Thrones and watching um, un bachelor. unboxing videos <laughs> on YouTube or watching The Bachelor. And I think and the thing I love about Anchor is that it enables it's the easiest way for anyone to make a podcast. And so it enables new voices to come forward. And we're doing something very different. I mean, Mike said, like, it was so hard to make a podcast. At Gimlet, it's still hard. <laughs> like, we make it hard because we have teams of people and our shows are highly edited and it's everything we do is curated and, you know, um, has original music and we're striving to, you know, um, elevate the experience of audio um, in people's lives. But the thing I love about the medium is that it has all kinds of different... Um, uh, all kinds of different voices and programming, and there's a flu there's a creative flourishing happening right now that we're just at the beginning of. Uh, and for Gimlet's hardcore fans in the audience, what's the future of memberships on Gimlet? Your membership product? Do you have plans to change that? Uh, well, I'm doing an M AMA with members on Thursday. Okay. And so perhaps I'll address that then. But right. yeah, yeah, no, we, we, have a, we have a membership program which is for like the hardcore um, Gimlet fans. I would say it's more of a, yeah, out there. Thank you. <laughs> Someone in the front row, of course. <laughs> Thank you. What is your name? <laughs> Gigi. Gigi. I have a name for waiting for a Gimlet podcast. What's the name? It's called Podgrasping. When you wait for it to come out. She has a name for waiting for when a Gimlet podcast comes out. It's called Podgrasping. <laughs> It's, it's like when you're grasping your phone, like yeah. waiting for the episode Refresh. to come. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the, that Gigi is a Gimlet member. Um, <laughs> and we want to make more episodes for you. not planted so, in the audience. No. So you don't have to do so much pod grasping in your life. Um, uh, yes. But I mean, that's the thing about, I mean, th that is the thing that, that I would say really has powered Gimlet is the sense of personal connection people have to the shows that we make, and it's certainly true of the shows on Anchor too. Like, I, I just think that is a unique thing to the medium, and, and um, you know, it's something we want to continue to deepen. What about analytics? I guess, Michael, starting with you guys, I know this is an area you guys focus on a lot, and you've got some updates on analytics for creators uh, to talk about today, but um, where are we at? Because it seems like for, for a long time, there were no analytics. You had no idea. Uh, who was listening, who was finishing, all you knew were downloads. Um, now that's changing. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think it's early days still. I think, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that the technology of podcasting um, hadn't changed a whole lot in the past decade or so. I think you're starting to see the change accelerate um, and move forward. And so I think that represents a great opportunity for analytics, which, which is one of the things that creators care most about. They want to know who their audience is, they want to know where they are. And they advertisers want, want to know. Yeah, and advertisers want to know, right? They want to know, uh, what, you know what they're buying. <clears throat> so I think it is important to, uh, to get analytics to a place that enable creators to make better decisions about the content, um, to make the ad experience better for consumers. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm really excited that Anchor is now a part of Spotify, um, because I think there's an opportunity to tap into some of those analytics and learn more about the audiences, and hopefully over time, expose more of that information to our creators. Um, we are, you asked a minute ago about um, 
some new stuff that we have coming just in the coming days, actually. We're going to be unveiling some new analytics in the Anchor web dashboard. We're going to be bringing um, you know, what I feel is like the most comprehensive set of uh, podcast analytics to our mobile app. Um, it's, mobile has been a particularly difficult area to get access to your analytics. So we're going to be making that a bit easier. Um, but I really think that's just the beginning. And I think the more we work closely with Spotify, the, the more we can push the medium forward and bring a lot more transparency to what's actually going on. Yeah, and I can tell you that, you know, there really isn't a unified way of uh, of really um, dis discerning what is being listened to because I think a lot of the metrics in the space is about downloads doesn't necessarily mean who has listened to a podcast. So I think we're going to see some shifts or some unification in in the metrics for the industry, and um, you know, I can tell you even for Spotify because. Spotify typically hasn't been in the production business. So we have all this, all this data, and it's about how do you pull the right data to understand what users want, what they're listening to, what topics are of interest. But really, when you look at, as an example, at a platform like Netflix, where they're really able to um, program to a certain segment of the population, understanding what people's interests are, um, that really is the opportunity that we will have as well. Are there ambitions to Don to create something like the first truly scaled ad tech platform for podcasts now that you have Anchor and you have all the data you have? Do you want to keep it all in house or do you want to create a, a marketplace potentially? No, for, I think for we're always about a marketplace. Um, you know, we, we, we pride ourselves on being one of the, you know, only two sided marketplaces with for both creators and for. Um, for users, and I think the advertisers will, will have great advantages um, for, for, for that being our position. But I think the overall industry, in addition to Spotify, has to really understand where the opportunities are for the advertisers, and I think that is, that is one of the things that we're going to work on as the industry now is starting to gain momentum and starting to mature. We don't have a ton of time left, but if you want to submit questions, um, we might be able to take some from the audience uh, towards the end of this in a few minutes. Uh, there should be instructions on the screen on how to do that, but feel free to submit questions. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Gimlet Pictures and video, Matt, because I mean, everyone's probably heard of the Amazon show Homecoming starring Julia Roberts based on one of your shows. You've got a horror podcast in production with, uh, with, with Bloomhouse. Is the plan to, to keep that operation running? Yes, absolutely. And, and I think it was one of the surprises that, that or at least surprises to me is that we could, when we, we could take our stories and bring them to other media. We really, um, we've always been motivated by creating um, new experiences for listeners starting in audio. So f the first thing is to make really compelling stories that, um, that, are, that take you deeper. But what we found with Homecoming um, and, and a number of other projects is that when you prove out a story in front of a large audience and you've basically built the, you've made the characters and you've built out the beats, it's very translatable to television. And so Homecoming started as a, a scripted podcast. Um, it's a government thriller and we produced two seasons of it. And what we found was there was a lot of interest from Hollywood in taking that and turning it to television. So yes, if you, if you looked around and saw a billboard with Julia Roberts's face on it, that was probably homecoming. There was a period in New York where you couldn't look, there was yeah. nowhere you could look without seeing I Julia guess. Roberts and homecoming, all based on the podcast. And we're at work on, uh, on season two of homecoming now. Um, and like you said, we're also developing, um, we have a horror show called The Horror of Dolores Roach. Um, which we're uh, co-producing with Blumhouse uh, for television now, and we have a, a number of other projects in development as well. So we're gonna we're we're gonna keep doing that. You know, Dawn has a deep history in television, so I think she's gonna she'll she'll help us there. As yeah, well. I mean, Dawn, with your background, formerly president of Condé Nast Entertainment, um, you know, Spotify has dabbled in video before. It's it's never really taken off. Um, does, do you see video opportunities with what Gimlet is doing? Well, I think what the way we look at it, because our focus right now is really audio on our platform, but we do believe that there's a lot of opportunity for the IP that we're creating to go on to other platforms. And, you know, I ran the CW network and I ran programming for Lifetime and many other networks. And 
I feel like where we are right now is IP is so valuable. Um, no matter where you sit, it really is the differentiating factor. And so it's no surprise that people are looking at podcasts as uh, a great form of IP and a great place to go for movies and for television. I was just on the phone actually before, before this um, panel, and I was talking to uh, Drake's manager, Future, and he was saying, podcast is gonna be everything soon. It's gonna be like uh, what magazines are, it's gonna be what newspapers are, it's gonna be all of storytelling because it's so flexible as a medium. So you can just see how many different stories and, and, and the different types of storytelling that can happen as a podcast. And so I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. And I can tell you that so many people call me um, looking to start ideas as podcasts. It could be even a script that's written that never sold. Let's reinvent it as a podcast, and then if it winds up taking off, you can then turn around and sell it again as a movie or as a TV show. This is a great way to test characters, test out story, build an audience, then have a built-in marketing capability. And so for all of those reasons, it makes a lot of sense to use, the, use podcasting as a way of, of you know, looking at, okay, is this great storytelling for podcasts themselves? Yes, but does it have potential to go on to another platform? Absolutely, and I think Gimlet really proved that. All right, I wanna take one of these questions from the audience. This is from Ricardo. He says, I'm an anchor in publishing, of course, in Spotify and loving it, but I'm doing it in Spanish, so I want to know what plans do you have for non-English content? So I can speak to the creation side for sure. Um, the Anchor app is available globally. Um, the, you know, the web dashboard is, is available globally. Um, we absolutely have support for creators um, of all different languages and all different parts of the world. Um, as far as the content experience and the consumption experience um, for Spanish-speaking content, Don's probably uh, in a better position to, to answer that, yeah. that half of the question. Now, we do have um, podcasts that are um, in, uh, in Spanish, so um, and we, uh, obviously U.S. and also from our LATAM uh, countries. All right, uh, I like this question too from Neil. He says, Spotify Premium gives you an ad-free experience. Will you give your premium customers the opportunity to listen to ad-free podcasts as well as music? So will I be hearing ads in Gimlet shows on Spotify in the future even if I'm a premium customer? Yes, we have ads in all of our podcasts, but be it on free or on premium, and we don't expect that to change. Okay. Um, what about your all's thoughts on consolidation in the space? Um, it seems like, especially after Spotify, you know, announced these two acquisitions, we're seeing incredible raises. This company called Luminary just raised like nearly $100 million. Uh, people are buying up exclusive rights. Um, it, it seems like we're going to see a lot more consolidation in the space this year and next year. Um, if you guys could look out to the end of 2020, do you think we have uh, fewer, bigger players in the space, or are we going to continue to see more and more startups, more and more smaller players vying for, for dominance? Uh, maybe, Michael, you want to start? Yeah, I think, I think if startups can find a way to differentiate either the consumption or the creation experience, we will no doubt see more startups enter the space. I mean, really, at the end of the day, it's about what the user wants. On the creation side, they want really easy-to-use tools. Um, they want to get their content out there with low friction, not have to pay. And on the consumption side, they want really, really fantastic content and a unique, differentiated listening experience. So I'm personally really excited to see the, the medium and the space unfold over the coming years. Matt? Consolidation? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's like a natural evolution of a market that's maturing. And I think you will... I, I think that the growth that we started this conversation around, right, like 25% growth in the number of monthly, podca monthly podcast listeners in the U.S. in the last year alone is validation that this is a medium that is top shelf and that it's hit the tipping point. And the Spotify acquisition of Gimlet and Anchor, I think, is another sign of that validation. I do expect there will be more startups. There may be more tech startups, more content startups, because this is growing into a real industry, and I think consolidation is part of that, too. Um, so yeah. Don? I think it's both. I think the, the industry is quite fragmented, uh, and I think there'll be consolidation because as the industry matures, you're going to see 
um, a lot of these companies, especially smaller companies, either be bought or smaller companies come together. But then, perhaps by Spotify. Perhaps. Um, but I also think there'll be a lot of room for new startups, and there'll be a lot of room for production, um, a lot of opportunity on the product and tech side. So I think we're really um, going to see a lot of growth across the board. And so, you know, I think it's going to be both. Um, the, oh, Spencer's got good questions. Um, this is, I like this idea about talking about length. What do you guys, uh, you know, with this narrative that, you know, our attention spans are all shortening with our phones and does length matter in podcasting? How short can it be? How long can it be? What gets the most uh, retention? Talk. We are amazed to see how engaged consumers are, users are with long podcasts. I mean, we have like, Joe Budden as an example. I mean, the, the audience on those shows um, average 90 minutes. I mean, it's just incredible to see how engaged people are with this content and how sticky it is and how long they'll stay. And that's why I said, you know, the podcast listeners, they're two hours longer than, than the other users. I think it has a lot to do with the time spent consuming. Like when you're consuming audio content, it's much different than consuming tweets or right. videos, right? You're, Multitask. Exactly. You're trying to fit, you know, scanning through your Twitter profile in the two minutes in between meetings, right? But when you're consuming audio, you're usually filling some other part of your day, like driving or commuting, um, where you've got time to, to really lean in and pay attention to, to what the podcast is saying. So I think, I think the short attention span really speaks to more visual content, whereas podcasts and audio are, are, are perfect for those other parts of the days where your, your hands are tied up and you've got some time to, time to kill, really. Don, um Daniel Eck has said that Spotify is going to spend around 500-ish million this year in podcast in the podcasting space on acquisitions. So that means you've after these two, you've got about 160 million left. Um, Who's counting? <laughs> uh, give or take. Um, what kind of deals are you looking for? What kind of companies are you looking for? Ad tech, IP. Um, what's the most attractive thing for you right now? I think we're looking at all sides of the business. Um, you know, because we really think there's opportunity all around. No, no more specifics than that. I, I tried. I tried. Um, okay. Well, I guess uh, last question for Matt. Are we going to get a startup episode on, on all this? I will say that my partner, Alex Bloomberg, who is the host and creator of the Startup Podcast, and for those who don't know, when we started the company, we did a documentary about what it was like to start a company. We recorded everything we did. We recorded our equity negotiation over what percentage of the company each of us owned. We reported, recorded our pitches to investors, and we put that all on this documentary. Um, and so I will say that in the last month, Alex recorded a lot of things that were happening in the office. I'm sure. We we had a we, you know when we had when we did the deal, we announced it at on on an earnings uh, in a pre-earnings announcement at 6 a.m. Eastern time. We were actually up all night finishing the deal. I think we signed at 3:30 a.m. and Bloomberg was there with his microphone recording everything. So um, I don't think we have anything to announce, but uh, stay tuned. All right, stay tuned. We're gonna have to leave it there. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you all.